spent a good like three years immersed in the world of Zimbabwe, driving to the Mount I uh, have been going around the state doing these things called community conversations. Uh, they are co-sponsored by the Human. They, we got a grant from the Humanities Council, and then it's a collaboration between the Department of Libraries and the um, Vermont Historical Society, and it sends me to small town libraries. And Andrew, how many have I done this month? Like 22, like that. I was in Stratford last night. I did four talks in three days at the end of last week, and I have this talk that I basically now can do in my sleep. Uh, <laughs> but I, I figured that I wouldn't come here today and give you that talk by any means, because I mean, part of it is like, have you ever heard of Sam Ogden? And I assumed that that would be a bit pointless in this audience. So I mean, I hope that you don't mind if I do a little script reading, because it, this is a unique standalone kind of talk. And uh, I just want to give you an idea about the origins of the book and what I was thinking about when I was working on it and the problems I was trying to work through and how I see it hopefully contributing to our understanding of where Vermont is now and where it's going in the future. And um, I think it's really audacious, sort of, and presumptuous of me. So I'm kind of nervous about this talk, obviously, because I mean, I've always felt like it's really presumptuous of me to tell your town's story. Um, you know, I'm not, I live in Danville, and I'm not even sure I could intelligently tell the st a story about Danville. I mean, but it's a thing where, you know, history is an art, it's not a science. And you get a really wonderful, fantastic story that's really, you think, is important and worth telling, and you want people to know about it, and you try to tell it as accurately as you possibly can. Um, and that's what I tried to do with this book. And then you tinker with it endlessly, and eventually, at some point, you actually have to release it out in the world and hope that people don't hate it, you know? Um, and so, uh, early in the talk, what happens is that I introduce some of the themes, and then I say, okay, so the story begins in the 1880s, and what happened was that Alonzo Valentine, who was a guy who owned a knitting mill in Bennington that made women's underwear, so he's the perfect guy to solve all of Vermont's rural problems. <laughs> um, he recruited Swedes, and he plumped them down into three different colonies, and one was supposed to be in Weston, although, as you know, it ended up in Landgrove, which at the time confused everyone. They thought the, the Weston colony had disappeared, but he was right over the town line. And then I say, and has anyone here heard of Landgrove? And uh, it depends upon where I'm giving the talk. I was in Manchester. There was like 80 people, 60 people there. And like I got like 10 hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was in Stratford last night. I got like three. Uh, I was in East Corinth, and there was 20 people, and they all just looked at me blankly. And I think that often what I say is good, because they really don't want you <laughs> and if, if my book results in an increase in the amount of traffic that goes up and down these streets as people do a little tour, then pe the people in Langdon are going to be really angry with me. They don't want extra traffic. Um, and that's the thing is that, I mean, this is such a unique and magical town. One of the things about the book tours I found out that, of course, there are some commonalities to the problems that the towns face, but every town is different. But I mean, I, there's no town that's different to me than um, Landgrove. Um, so I thought that um, just instead of telling you about Sam, uh, I would tell you something about the origins of the book. And, and really the thing is, like, I am incredibly privileged. Uh, I am one of two people in the world <laughs> who have a tenure track position teaching Vermont history. And it's really an amazing thing. And there's a Vermont history community, and when you teach Vermont history, like twice a year, every year, for a long time. <laughs> After a little while, the other people in the Vermont history community are like, well, do you have anything to say? Have you learned anything? Do you have anything to contribute at all? And uh, the answer was that I was really thinking about over time the relationship between how Vermont has, Vermont state leaders have traditionally thought about and conceived and acted upon the physical landscape and the relationship that that has with the way that they've thought about and acted upon the human landscape, and the tension and conflict between those things. And I was also really aware that the story of the 19th century, the way I wrote it in an earlier book, is about the squabbles between the people in the big towns and the people in the small towns, and how they don't agree about anything, you know, and it was like team A and team B. But the story of the 20th century, really, increasingly as time goes along, isn't about conflict between people. It's between conflict within people. It's about having to make sacrifices between two things that are in conflict with each other uh, because you can't have both. And about 
paradoxes and being torn between the desire to have tradition and progress at the same time and the desire to have um, development and preservation at the same time and all these things that are really tricky that make people really confused and uh, internally uh, torn. Uh, but as I originally conceived the book, it was going to be, a, like my first book, a history of Vermont is like the whole story. And after I served on a million committees and done all the things you have to do to get tenure, I really turned my attention to this book and it was like spinning wheels. I, I didn't know what to do. It was really hard. And I, starting a book is really hard, I have to tell you. And so there, oh, I meant to actually hand these out. Uh, this is, and I'll just hand out a couple packets. So this is from my first book. And these, if you want to hand these around, these is actually the origins of the uh, book that, that Rob just showed you. Uh, here you can hand some, so here you are. Uh, these are the, this is the three or so paragraphs in which um, the Swede story is mentioned. Because the thing was, I was doing the research heavily and just deeply embedded in Gilded Age Vermont. And from 1889 to the fall of 1890, the only thing anyone could talk about was the Swede program. And it's a big squabble in people of Vermont, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful program, it's going to regenerate rural Vermont. And then other people are like, why are we giving that money to local boys? Why are we wasting it on outsiders? And you can see it's just this little bit. And everyone said at the time, and I think it's mostly because there was a colony in Berkshire, and that colony broke up like overnight. And then the word got out around the country that the Swede program is a complete fiasco, and they all moved to Minnesota, and that's the end of it. And then they canceled the commissioner of agriculture position in the fall of 1890, and everyone in Vermont agreed to never talk about it ever again. <laughs> and the idea that I'm thinking about like how Vermont over time, how state leaders have tried to engineer the human landscape, which is something that still goes on. Um, I thought, well, that's an interesting story, and I ought to be able to get an article out of it. And so at the time, our computer was in my basement, and so I went back over it, it to a greater extent, was reading newspaper articles, contemporary articles about the Swede program, and I ran through the whole story, and I really had an article that was just about Valentine's program. But I was thinking, well, I wonder what could happen if you could track down, and I think actually my wife Andrew was like, what happened, so what happened to the Swedes? I was like, I don't know, they moved to, they moved to Minnesota, I don't know. And, um, but I knew that John Nordgren, who was the person that Valentine hired to go to Sweden, I knew which boat he came back on. The British princess on, landed on like April 20th, 1890. So I got the manifest from the customs officials, the immigration, and I started going through the list, and bang, there are the Andersons, because they were listed alphabetically. And the Anderson family lived just over the border in, um, in Weston. But it, they were basically part of that contiguous colony of Swedes. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the Andersons ended up living in Brattleboro. Uh, almost all of them did, except for Hilma, who lived over in Danby, and I've been to see her grave. Uh, and so then I went through the rest of, and matching up you know, the people, and I got to the Nielsens, and I, there's another hit, bang, with John Nielsen. And then you go through, and, um, I didn't find the Westines in the transcript because it was spelled with like a G. It was a very strange spelling. But once I figured out that some of the families had ended up in Land Grove, I went through all the, eight, the 1900 census, and there's 32 of them, and they're all still here. They need to the parents and the children, and there they are. And that was the phase where, at that point, I went down to the Vermont History Historical Society's fair in Tunbridge. And I was like, where's the Land Grove exhibit? Where's the Land Grove? I didn't want to find the Land Grove exhibit. Because I wonder if anyone in Land Grove has any clue what I'm talking about, about the Swedish program. And I ended up there and met Priscilla, and you had an exhibit on it. I was like, oh my god, I can't it. I have an exhibit on it. Can you come give me a tour? And that was the phase where um, I figured that what I can do is I can tell the story of the Swedes that I can tell the story of 20th century Vermont through the story of just the Swedes. And what happened to them, the, the Andersons ended up in Brattleboro, the Westings ended up in Chester, a lot of them worked at, um, the, in Springfield Machine Tool Company, uh, the Nyrens ended up in Paulette and Arlington, and 
Yeah, yeah I mean, I went through them. The Nielsen's sort of drifted around after the Arlington, actually. And um, I began to drive around the state and interview um, descendants. Um, and some of these were more successful than others. Uh, there are Westings here, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, do you know you know Leslie Westing? Yes. And so, I actually, I, 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 I'm really grateful that I got him on the phone. But he was he was like 93, and he was out mowing his lawn. <laughs> and I was and I got on the phone, and I was like, "Tell me about your grandfather Carl." And he was like, "They're just normal people." <laughs> and I was like, "Well, you know, how long did you know them? We used to go stay there all summer long when I was a kid." And I was like, "Well, tell me about them. They're just normal people." <laughs> that was the less productive. Um, you know, the Nirenes, um, the closest, uh, Anne and Irene came over when she was four, and they lived over on Little Michigan Road. Uh, and Anne and Irene had a daughter in 1920 <coughs> who was named Lillian Fellows Abbott. And I went over, and she lived in Wilder, White River Junction, and she was like 92, 93. I mean, that was the closest connection I could find to the actual Swedes who came over in 1890. You know, and I interviewed Lottie Nyrene's kids. It was a fantastic phase. But during that phase, I was coming down. Priscilla gave me a tour, and I came back down again. And I was like, "This is such a fabulous town. What's the story?" And that's right when I had my one and only sabbatical I've had in my professional life, and. I devoted that to like, what is the deal with Sam Ogden? And how did this all happen? And just like the whole story began to take shape about, I mean, this is a really special story. This is a, a magical thing. Yeah, could I make Yeah, please. To tell people. The reason that we had a sweet um, exhibit at all was because of Carl Fister Sr., who um, was a, a very important person here. I wish he were still here. And he had he got interested in the Swedes because he knew some of them. And he had bought a house that, that one of the Swedes families had I mean he got to he knew some of these people. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he was a scientist and he was an incredible researcher. He yeah. spent hours and hours here looking up things. Yeah. And it's really only because of him, because he saw a story there that yeah. he got us interested in. And we had photographs, and we had archives, and uh, all of that kind of thing. So really, we need to thank him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, I, I went out of the way to make sure at the end of the book that I mentioned him. And I mentioned you, and I mentioned <laughs> Sally and Duncan. Um, not gratuitously, it, it was necessary. Um, but uh, I mean, it was an honor to be able to do that. Yeah, and I know the impact it's had on the, on preserving the, the memory, the history of this you know, extraordinary town. Um, so I was going to say, you know, I, then I, I've spent a, I've spent a good like three years immersed in the world of Sam Ogden, driving to from my historical society, special collections to BBM, driving down here, doing all the research online I could possibly do. And you know, the thing about Sam Ogden for me that makes him extraordinary to me is that he's so unusual compared to most people. Most people just sort of accept the destiny that's given them. And Sam saw the destiny that he had, the world that was, he had been given, and he rejected it. He made a world a reality for himself. He saw things as they were and said no, and went out and created the world that he wanted for himself, which is not the easiest thing in the whole world to do. And it's really an extraordinary accomplishment for someone to do that. I have the most respect for him for that reason. And I really admire that about him. You know, I mean, most people live lives of quiet desperation, as the old saying goes. And he refused to do that. And he created so much of what you, what is this town um, right now. Um, but the, also the thing about him that is so wonderful is that he became enmeshed in the great paradoxes and challenges and uh, problems of the 20th century in Vermont. I mean, when I go on the talk, when I go on my talking tour, the, the talks I've been doing, you know, one of the big things I say is that like, Sam Ogden thought that small town democracy was one of the best things about Vermont. You know, that, that local control really matters and that small town governments really have an important impact on people's lives. But yet he spent his adult life building and serving bureaucracies that made it so that small town local control was less important. And in the 1960s, he, um, in 1963, when he was on the Governor Hawks Preservation Senior Preservation Committee, he advocated a statewide land use law 
But you couldn't get that through the old one-town, one-vote legislature. So then they reapportioned in 1965, and we got Act 250, and he thought reapportioning the legislature was the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> and that's kind of the way Vermont is for everyone, which is you need to sort of make trade-offs. You, trade you need to sort of make sacrifices. You need to balance your desire to have two conflicting things. And it's something that has been <laughs> incre it's increasingly the story of the 20th century, and it's something that carries into the 21st century. You know? And so making Vermont grow without appearing to make it grow at all is a really tricky problem. And the subtitle of my book, and this is something I learned from studying Sam, the subtitle of my book is The Paradox of Development in the 20th Century. And I can state the paradox really easily and clearly. The paradox is that making Vermont look natural takes a lot of work. <laughs> it's really hard. And the more you want to make it look like you're not putting any effort into managing the environment, the more effort you have to put into it. And you have to build bureaucracies and hire experts and do a lot of management and planning and zoning and all of this just in the interest of making it look like you don't do any of these things at all. And that's the problem. Making Vermont look natural takes a lot of work. And so this really resonates with people. And now I'm gonna, I want to show you a bit of video. And it's a bit of video that I show to pretty much every single one of the talks that I do. So I build myself up. And basically, the punchline, to some extent, is at the beginning, I say, so in half an hour or 20 minutes, I want to get you to the point where you understand why, in the late 1940s, Vermont appointed as chair of the Development Commission, the body that was responsible for stimulating development in the state, a back to the lander who hated change and development of all kinds and didn't want it. And if that doesn't make any sense, nothing about Vermont ever does. And so I get to that point. And then I say, OK, so the sound may not be great on this, but I'm going to try to give you a little bit of um, the uh, background for living. And so Sam Ogden, as development commissioner, commissioned four movies in 1949, Move on Skiing. But this is the best one. It's called Background for Living. And so the, uh, have some of you seen this? OK, great. This is high quality material. Vermont, to those who name it, meant a land of friendly green mountains, a land perhaps not easy, but rewarding in its response to those who loved and won it, and made the term Vermonter a symbol of resourceful and contented independence. To the many who visit Vermont today, its meanings are as varied as their expectations, and the pleasures it affords are by no means always measured in money. The waters are open to holiday makers with yachts. They're open to those who like to dive and swim and bask on the hundreds of beaches. Recreation may be as active or as restful as the age and disposition of vacationers may prefer, although there is ample evidence that in Vermont, Years seem to do little to abate a youthful zest in living. Some visitors enjoy the facilities of family resort centers, while others choose the more rural Vermont of apple blossoms signaling spring in hillside orchards. Some prefer summer horseback trips over miles of little traveled roads and woodland trails, trails which turn to red and gold when autumn shimmers northward through the mountains. And, of course, there are the famous mountain slopes where snow lies crisp and deep throughout the winter. What can Vermont mean to you? Well, if you're an artist like William Chaldack, it will mean an infinite variety of subjects for your brush and canvas. To Sam Ogden, it has meant the creative set. Okay, and I stop it there. <laughs> and I suppose a, a couple of things to say about this. Number one, if I was the development commissioner, in 1949, and I was discoursing the money for this movie, I would totally insist on being in it. Just like Sam. <laughs> you know? I want to be in it. And I'll tell you, not getting the money. 
You know, number two, nothing says development like retired people playing croquet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, and it's just charming, you know. It's this vision of uh, a, 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 a life on a human scale. It's a Vermont way of life. And it's holistic. I mean, there was one time when the Bureau of Publicity in Vermont just sold Vermont as a scenic landscape. And it was beautiful. It was um, Vermont's vaca America's vacation land, uh, America's Switzerland. Uh, and they would t always put advertisements in big city newspapers and talk about, come see Vermont's cushiony gravel roads. And it's like, <laughs> uh, but by the time Sam and his cohort of people, Bress Thornton and Walter Hart and Dorothy Kentville Fisher, that whole wonderful cohort of people, um, they had a very strong vision of Vermont as a way of life. And it was holistic. It wasn't just about the scenery, it was about community and strong energy attachments. It was about involvement in civic affairs. If you want to have food, you grow it yourself. If you don't have the tools you need, you start a fortune and you make it yourself. If you want to have a good school, then you get involved in the school and you make it a good school. And most of all, if you want to have good government, you get involved in government. But the key to this was you could only do this on a small scale. And Vermont had to remain on a small scale. And they had a very clear vision of that. And there's a bit of a human cost to that sometimes. There's this one quote in Earl Newton's book of the Vermont story in 1949, which he says, Sam Ogden is the development commissioner, and he has no plans to lure industries to this state. And it's like, what kind of development commissioner doesn't want industries to this state? But that's the thing. He had a very clear idea about what Vermont should be. And for better or worse, I mean, it is... I, I mean, think it's for better, you know? It's, it's really important that Vermont remain oppositional to the direction of the rest of the United States. Vermont needs to be a special place. And he did this enormous amount of work in order to, to keep it that way. And so, you know, people yearn for the type of community that is possible in Vermont. And I know that we have challenges. Um, people are often frustrated with Vermont. Um, they can even be really pessimistic about the future. But people tend to have a passionate love for Vermont. And we're talking about the love for the state as it is now, which Sam Ogden did so much to help create. Um, I, it, it's a very elusive, very frustrating to try to find that like elusive balance between like perfectly matching up, balancing preservation and development and progress and tradition, and wherever that perfect balance, that sweet spot is, can be incredibly hard to find. And I know that Sam um, suffered from that too. So he struggled with that, about what exactly is the right amount of growth and what is the right kind of growth and what do you save and what do you preserve and how much personal control of your property do you need to cede to the state in order so that you can have this but not give up that. And it's very hard. Um, and Sam didn't start this process and the study of the state comprehensively to figure out the way forward and how you preserve what's best about Vermont. He certainly did a lot of it when he was in his prime. He didn't finish it either, and it continues on to this day. Uh, in 2010, there was this thing called the Council on the Future of Vermont. And it was out of the, the, the um, uh, rural development, uh, the Council on the Rural Development of Vermont, right? And they did this comprehensive study. I helped contribute to it. And it began, Vermont has a history of envisioning the future. Um, Everyone, all the agencies in Vermont measure and evaluate the state's progress, envisioning a place where common goals can be realized. Over the time, these studies have engaged in the United Vermonters, inspired leaders, etc. Um, the belief of the Vermont Council, Council on Rural Development in the, is the belief that in this time of rapid change, 2010, we need to take a step back and consider the big picture trends, evaluate opportunities and challenges ahead, and consider common Vermont priorities. And what it found out, the council did, is that there's an enormous amount of um, consensus in Vermont about what actually people want. The problem is that what they want are things that are in conflict with each other. I mean, 92% of the state agrees that, 92% of the people agree, I value the working landscape and its heritage. 88% say, I value the small size and scale of the state. But then 15% agree that I believe the private property rights are well respected in Vermont. Uh, they found that about 70% of people believe that what the state should be organized around is small village cores, and that that's really important that people live around village cores like that. And they also found that 75% of people, given a choice between living in a village core and having a big house out in the country, 
want the big house out in the country. <laughs> and that's just a really old sort of Vermont dilemma. They found that the three most significant values that emerged from the Set Council on the Future of Vermont Studies are independence, community ties, and a working landscape. Vermont residents, it says, are very connected, are connected on a very intimate level with their environment and the heritage that exists in the state. And so in order to have those things, you need large-scale regional and statewide solutions to the challenge of preserving Vermont. And so as we move into the 20th, as we're in the 20th century, as it's a continuation of the century that Sam occupied and did so much to shape. And what gives me optimism about the future in Vermont is that Vermont has always been about trying to find balance and that it's a journey, not a destination, as much for us now as it was for Sam from the 19, early 1930s all the way up until the 1970s. Um, Vermont has obviously changed. Um, Sam wrote himself in The Cheese That Changed Many Lives. He wrote, it must be obvious that the old days and the old ways of the rural, of the rural backwards community are by now a thing of the past. And that line always reminds me of this line that's in a book from 1974 by a dear friend of mine whose name is Frank Bryan, who taught political science at UVM. And he wrote in that book that what the world need, desperately needs is a return to the community axiom, the community axiom, which promises a return to the good old days, to traditional American values, to a simple life of interpersonal relationships where individuals still control events in society generally and in the government as well which can only exist on a small scale. And he says, but if you move to Vermont in 1974, you'll find that the system axiom has taken over. This leaves Vermont efficient and bureaucratic, conducting decision-making in a centralized location, and disdaining town meetings as a quaint ritual to placate the community types. Vermonters end up heavily taxed, isolated by choice, and spiteful of outsiders. Which is a really powerful idea. You know, it strikes at the very heart of what Sam wanted and what we continue to want now. And it's a wholly accurate, unfortunately, maybe, uh, summation of the problem. Um, but uh, it's a process that's been at work since colonial times. I mean, the world has all continuously gotten modern. And Vermont, almost uniquely, has made an effort to resist that in the healthiest possible way. And so, you know, the fact that that such a challenge to try to hold on to the community axiom isn't a reason to throw up your hands and give up. It's a, it's a rallying cry. It, it, it's exactly that. It's a call to action. Because if there's one thing that Vermont history can teach you, and it can, the story of Landgrove teaches you this, the story of Sam teaches you this, and the story of the Swedes wherever they went into the industrial areas that they moved, and they worked jobs like sign painters and truck drivers and lumb, working in lumber yards. It's, all of these people want the same things that people in the good old days wanted. Community, civility, tolerance, democracy, freedom, unity, you know? And these are goals. Um, never achieve perfectly, but we still work at them. And so Vermont's obligation is to show the rest of the nation and the world how perfect balance can be achieved. And if it comes with a healthy dose of frustration and paradoxes and internal conflict, that's what urges us forward. Uh, it's not cause to give up. And so we stand on the shoulder of giants like Sam Arkin. Um, and we owe it to him and countless other Vermonters from that era to continue the path of trying to approximate a perfectly balanced society. And that's what I was thinking when I wrote the book. So, um, I um, came down here, and I didn't know if when I got here you were all going to pull out your knives, because I did write a book about your town <laughs> that I don't know as well as you do. Um, and I don't know how many of you had a chance to actually read it or engage with it on any level, um, but I would like nothing more in this world than to hear thoughts about land growth um, now and thoughts about the book and any questions you might have. I'd be more than delighted to um, hear what you have to say. And uh, I also like sitting, because I'd rather have this be more like a conversation about your town. You know? And if there's anything that I got wrong, Rob, you can tell me. You know, the book's already gone to print. Oh, thanks, that's great. I mean, you, I mean, you know the story of Landgrove as well as I do about how Sam came here and bought the cheese, the grants bought the cheese at the store, and a lot of people don't know that story. Really? Yeah. I mean, do you want to tell the story? No. <laughs> <What's your name? laughs> the reason we're all here is because um, the, the Sam was trying to find a new existence. The best thing that could happen to him happened to him in 1927. His dad died because his dad. Had, made a life for him as an insurance salesman 
in the woods of New Jersey, and he did not want that. So after that, he drove to, to find a place to live. He, they went to Kentucky, and which is where Maine was. Where Mayor Maine was from, and did a little tour of the United States, and they ended up in Peru because they had family friends there. And then um, I'm trying to remember um, Charlie Duncan Grant Charlie. Yeah, yeah they, he decided. I eat cheese, and the only good place to get good cheese is at the Colburn store, which didn't have a sign on it. You had to know it was there. <laughs> and they drove in, and Sam looked at the village, which had seven houses and two barns, and only one of the houses was occupied. And he said, how much for the village? And the guy said, $4,000, around $4,000. <laughs> so we plunked down the money and bought a village, and that was That's a month sorry. before the stock market crashed. <laughs> yeah. And we had nothing left but his village, so they moved up here. And what's amazing about it is how quickly it became a really successful summer community. It only took a couple years. <laughs> like by 30, that was 30, and by 32, 33, he was selling off these houses to architect friends of his and artists and other people that he knew from New York and created this wonderful community. It was a very artsy community. A very artsy community, absolutely. By the time it was in its prime in the 50s, there were world-class musicians here, puppeteers, um, novelists, a remarkable community of, of incredibly talented people. He was bringing in incredible musicians. Uh, I can't remember the name. Sally? Dan Milstein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Milstein. And Sunday afternoons, if you could get them together, uh, they would all play together. And I remember hearing them play along, and Sam was not that good of a musician. <laughs> and he was trying to play cello, and he'd screw up in the cello and say, oh, hold it, get damn I screw it up again, let's start over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, for those of you who don't know, he helped found the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, yeah. and was the president of it for 20-something years, for a long time. And he'd have the head of the symphony orchestra playing with him here. Yeah, yeah, who was based over at Middlebury. I think, right? And, yeah, uh, and you know, I mean, doing this research on Sam was amazing because, I mean, obviously this extraordinary town, which to such a great extent is his creation, but he's like the Where's Waldo of Vermont in the 20th century. He's everywhere, you know? Who founded the Water Resources Board? Who fought the war to ban billboards? Who started Vermont Life Magazine? Who installed the lifts at Bromley? Who, and, and actually, I have, we have, my family, have, we have ski passes at Stout. And when we go to the Mansfield Lodge, I always like to put my bag right next to the fireplace because there's a plaque on it that says, this building built by the Vermont Development Commission, 1940, and says Sam Ogden on it. So that's where I put my bag. I'm really happy about that. It's really cool. He's everywhere. He did such an extraordinary amount in his life, you know, uh, not just in this town, but statewide. He really did. I, I yeah, think please. what's interesting is how Langrove has uh, survived as well as it has, and it is because of the people that are here, and we really do have a, a community, and a very loyal community. And I think it's extraordinary, because it's almost 100 years. Mm -hmm. and, and so these things I'm doing are community conversations. And I mean, that's so much about what my book was about, is how can you maintain strength in a community? And a lot of places find it very hard to maintain a community. I mean, it's sometimes people. what they'll say, I'll have like, I mean, at a small talk, I'll have like 10 people to talk, and they'll, and they'll say, well, well, I'm on the school board, and I'm on the recycling center, and we all volunteer at the library and all this, and I'll be like, well, it sounds great. They're like, yeah, but it's only us. It's all the same people doing all everything. <laughs> and everyone else drives into their garage, especially in, you know, commuter towns. I mean, talking in like, well, Norwich and Queechy and Stratford and places <laughs> like this, and it's like, we're better than and it's really hard to maintain a strong sense of community. And I'll tell you, one of the parts of writing the book was when I found that 2004 article in the Burlington Free Press that called Landgrove like something about like the ideal flatlander haven or something like that, you know? And so I was like, that is not. It is like this incredibly strong community of people with multi generational ties who all care deeply about each other. I mean, that other places would have the problems that Landgrove has. I mean, they should be so lucky, you know. I thought, and I say in the book that I, you could give the quote. It's really unfair. I thought that article was really unfair. Other towns have that challenge of, of uh, a lack of persistence in the human landscape. 
that there aren't enough people. And the thing about community is that, as Sally, as you know, it's shared experiences. I mean, community is not buildings and, and trees and roads and things. Building, community exists in what you can't see, not what you can see. And it, it takes a long time to build a strong community, but it can be very fragile and disrupted really easily. And a lot of towns have this example. Too many second homes, too many commuters, people who are a bit, you know, coming in and out, people who've lived there for five years and screw up the town and then leave, you know, and everyone has to clean up the mess, that kind of thing. And it's, maybe I'm not right about this, but it seems like Land Grove has evaded all of that and has been able to maintain a really strong sense of, of community, which is it's something that so many people in this, in this state and in this world want. Is that fair to say? You're asking me. Well, <laughs> you would know better. I'm not for, I'm well, not, I mean, I think well, you. How did you even let me write a book about your town? I'm just so grateful. I mean, you think of um, towns like this one. Um, uh, there's a certain uniqueness to them, but they have their ups and downs, just as all other towns do. So I don't, I don't feel this is the perfect <laughs> But um, as people who live here, um, if we have many of the same problems that other towns have, you can't get people to do things. Mm -hmm. and, um, we have workhorses that stay workhorses and workhorses until they can hardly move anymore. So that kind of, we have the same kinds of things, but not to the, the degree, I think, that others do. Is that fair? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> 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 That, 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 that Land Grove has a lot of the same challenges that other towns have, but not to the degree. And that, it, I mean, having a strong community takes work. It's hard work, and it involves commitment by people. But the impression I got when I was researching this book is that people in Land Grove are willing to do that work. Yeah. Very, very true, but also, you have to be able to afford to live here. Mm -hmm. And this is something I think is difficult for the younger generation. <coughs> what kind of jobs are there uh, to, to enable them to live here? Uh, my husband was one of the, <laughs> his family were one of the first ones that bought the first house from Sam Ogden. His parents were doctors in New Jersey. My husband always loved Land Grove and always said, we'll retire here. But we had to wait. To retire. We had four children and we had to wait uh, to be able to come back here. And I think that's great um, to be able to come back. But uh, I think that middle time would have been great also if there had been something for him to do um, to live here. Yeah, the same so, for me. I would love to have raised my yeah. kids here, but I'm a geologist. And there just weren't any jobs as a geologist in the entire state. I think they were fine outside of academia. So I had to be elsewhere and then retire and come back here. Well, this is what made this is what made Land Grove the perfect book, town to write about because the problems for the whole state are how do you make your town how do you make it grow without appearing to make it grow at all? How do you change it without having it appear to change at all? And that's very hard. No one here wants a dramatically different land grove. But how do you get a land grove that's different enough that it's a more democratic landscape? And, and this is a problem in lots of towns. You know, it's, 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 having both a, a, a scenic landscape and a democratic landscape is a really tricky thing. And there's nothing, if, if that problem is magnified here, then I picked the right town to write about. But there's nothing unique about it, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, it, one of the big problems in lots of towns in Vermont is that they don't have enough young families. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I did, I've talked to places like Chelsea and Rochester, places like this, and they've lost their schools, or are about to lose their mm -hmm. schools, and that is one of the hardest things that a town can go through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. Um. I'm, I, my name is Susan. I'm a second homeowner who recently left her primary home, so maybe this is my home. I know it's good. <laughs> but um, I recently uh, came back from Scotland, and we were touring the Western Islands of Scotland, and they have a similar po problem where people left to go to London, Glasgow, Edinburgh to work and make money. 
And there's a community of architects who are trying to bring people back again, to build community again. And, and, and it's funny, because I, you know, we talk about this here in Langrove, and, and I picked up on it, and I thought, well, what are they doing? How are they trying to do this? And one of the ways they're doing it is by affordable housing. Um, but they're built, they're creating homes that are just like amazing from an architectural point of view, very simple barn-like homes. Um, but they're affordable. And so the younger generation can afford to come back and, and build one of these homes. Um, but yeah, they, it, it, inevitably the question is, how do they sustain their life? And I always wonder, is it, is it a turn back to, um, a turn away from globalization and um, going back to a more handcrafted um, rural existence. You know, is the world does does the world have to do that in order to be sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are people willing to do that? I mean, I think you see it in Vermont because, for example, the cheesemakers, for example, that whole movement of people going back to a, a, a skill or craft that used to be here. And there must, you know, yeah. I, there's the wool community um, <coughs> over in Washington County, lots of people making, yeah. or having yeah. sheep and stuff like that. But, oh no, it's, a, it's something that... No, I mean, and, and considering the uh, environmental challenges we face, you know, like the, the farmer's market model is a really powerful model. The question is, can you make it so that the products that farmers markets are affordable for everyone? And that's really tricky. Yeah. You know, that if we go back to a craft economy, can it be affordable? Number one. Number two about, well, I sometimes feel really, like weird about mentioning specific towns, but Norwich, uh, they're trying to figure out how to get affordable housing. For example, they just don't know where to put it. And the utilities and the stormwater runoff and all that stuff, it's really complicated. They know for a fact. This is really complicated. And on the subject of growth, this is a classic Vermont thing. I live in the Northeast Kingdom, right? And people there are like, we need to grow. We need to have more jobs. We need to be able to keep young people. We need to be able to get more young families like this. And then like the state will come and be like, well, you know, I know that like Nebraska and South Dakota, the rural areas are emptying out. But the nice thing about Vermont, about the Northeast Kingdom, it's so close to the East Coast. And so the ability of you to lure people to the Northeast Kingdom is an advantage that other places don't have, number one. Number two, you have to be prepared for climate change refugees. And this is coming. It's actually coming, and it's going to create huge pressure on the housing stock because someone's going to pump down $800,000 for a $300,000 house. You know, and, all, and people are like, whoa, 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 that's too much change. We don't want to change that much. You know? I mean, so there's a sweet spot there where you change enough that you're a vibrant community, but you don't change too much that you lose the character of the place. You know, I mean, it's almost like, oh, the Northeast Kingdom should complain about having these problems of too much growth. But I mean, it would be a problem. How do you plan for climate change refugees, which is a thing that's going to happen? And Vermont's perfectly positioned to absorb those people. If you want young families, they're probably going to be desperate to get here within 20 or 30 years, right? I mean, all projections are that. <coughs> the projection of the federal government uh, is a General projections are that over like the next 50 years, it's 70 million people that can be displaced by climate change. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to go? You know, it's like, well, I hope we get some, but not too many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds funny, but I mean, it's really a problem. How much do you want land growth to change? You know, um, but it's, I mean, everything but Vermont is a challenge. It always has been. Um, so anyway, I mean, if, yeah, please. I have a yeah. question. You said yeah. it earlier than Sam Ogden's period yeah. in your book. It's about the Swedes, and it was interesting to read in one of your uh, books that was put out. I think you gave us an excerpt of it here. Yeah. That at the time it was deemed a failure. Absolutely. But has anyone gone on to count how many of the Swedish descendants there are in the state, and if they are industrious people or not. So it's like rather short-sighted to say the experiment failed and not gone back to revisit uh -huh. that. Um, 
Yeah, uh, on that subject, you know how Valentine, what he wanted to do was repopulate the Vermont? And um, the Lonnie DeRosia, Nyreen Tiff DeRosia, lived to two, within two days of her 100th birthday in 1976. And um, when Lonnie died in 1976, two days short of her 100th birthday, she had four children, three stepdaughters, 10 grandchildren, 16 great-grandchildren, and seven great-great-grandchildren, all of whom lived in Vermont. Alonzo Valentine had not been entirely wrong in his belief that his recruitment program would help to repopulate Vermont. <laughs> now, whether he brought about 68 Swedes, and whether um, and no one knew how much money he spent. He was given $2,000, and then he spent like eight or 10000 which, as you can imagine, wasn't popular in the state legislature in 1890. Um, but, I mean, the thing was, like, in that art, first of all, that book I took you have is 100% wrong. <laughs> it's actually what everyone called it a fiasco. But there's lots of other historians. I was going on what other historians have said. They all said they all left. Because at the time, everyone said they all left. Uh, and then, so when I went and tracked down descendants, I'll tell you that, well, just one of the Anderson kids was Charlie. He was, Charlie was the first Anderson born, the first of any of the five sweet families born in Vermont. He was born in 89. And Charlie had four kids by his first wife. And then she died, and then he had eight kids by his second one. Twelve <laughs> kids. And they all settled in Brattleboro. And Brattleboro is stupid with Andersons. It's teeny tiny. <laughs> <laughs> one of the crazy things about it for me was that none of the descendants I talked to had ever heard of the Sweden Recruitment Program. And one example is that um, Arlene Nielsen was um, Alvey's daughter. She used to actually work at the camp. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Arlene. And then Arlene moved to, um, to Arlington and worked in the health chair factory. And Robert Tift is actually Lottie and Irene's um, grandson. And he moved to Arlington. And the two of them knew each other for like 40 years. And they had no idea of their connection to each other. No one I talked to. I mean, I talked to Lillian, who's fellows out whose mother had come over in this program, and she was like, what the hell are you talking about? She did what? Uh -huh. This program was what? Yes. How many West Deans are there? With that? How many West Deans are there? How many West Deans are there? Uh, yeah. We wouldn't be able to count. I mean, we're on our sixth generation now, and yeah. many of them are still yeah. She has a beautiful picture of a huge West Deans family. In 1939, yeah, and they so, married into families that are here in town, the Carltons, the Wilsons, yeah, the Carters, the Hills, yeah. I mean, names that you recognize. So right. it's a contemporary problem now for the state of Vermont, and they have some ideas out there how they're going to get people to come, give them $5,000, yeah. but maybe they need to revisit some of these old ideas that at the time, didn't seem very productive, but if they looked into it a little further, they may see that they've got a lot of uh, hard-working citizens in the yeah. state that stuck it out yeah. and lived a hard scrabble life all these years. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, thank God they did bring Carl and uh, Anna. Wow. This is, so this is so that's team. after Willie died. This is um, Willie. Is, yes, yeah. Willie. This is Carl and Anna. Westing. They died in 1949, yeah. and it's their children, their spouses, and the next generation. So this is three generations of just Carl Westing. And Jenny's and kids. And Jenny. Yes, Jenny's children and are here. And Nola's kids. Nola. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Wow, that's really neat. That, it, it did work. The program did work. Yeah, so, yeah. So I need to exonerate Valentine and say, yes, you did a good job. Look at all the people you brought to Vermont. I mean, the problem, of course, with the program was it was incredibly steeped in ethnocentrism. Mm -hmm. Is that, that, well, we have a lot of French Canadians and they're terrible people, so we'll bring Swedes over because they're <laughs> tall and blonde and Protestant and they don't form unions and yes. all of that. You know, that, I mean, that is not just an element of it, that was what it was about. Yes, okay. Um, so we might not go in that specific direction in 2019, but uh, 
I mean, Valentine provided Vermont with good citizens. They became Vermonters. They served in the military. They paid their taxes. They worked at some of the biggest industries. They founded small businesses. They became Vermonters. He provided Vermont with wonderful citizens. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, the bottom line, of the, and I wrote this, an article, and the, bottom, the last line of it was, calling this program a, a fiasco is unfair. It wasn't a fiasco. It was expensive. <laughs> But it wasn't, a, it, you know, he wanted to provide Vermont with good citizens. He did exactly that. <clears throat> yeah, it didn't seem that expensive. What's that? It doesn't seem that expensive. Well, when the legislature gives you $2,000 and then you can't account for all the money you spent, you're going to make some enemies. <laughs> and people estimated it was between eight and $10,000. That was in 1888? Yeah, yeah. 1890 is when they came over. And... Uh, one thing I could never sort out was who paid their, their passage. Uh, and the assumption at the time was that Valentine had paid their passage over here. You know, and then people were like, you told us you bring us good citizens and you brought us a whole bunch of impoverished lumberjacks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which was not inaccurate. Um, but I mean, obviously they stayed. And so, uh, have, you, have you read the book? So I'm not your not this book. I was hoping to purchase one tonight. Oh, sorry. I I've been asking the VHS for a box of them for a while. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another sore point. Um, you know, I went through all the so and and so the, they all lived close to each other. That generation of Willie's kids, in particular, I was really fixated on um, Glenn mm -hmm. and Leslie and Howard. Yeah, Howard. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and most of them lived in Chester and commuted to Springfield mm -hmm. and worked for like fellow gear shapers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, became wonderful citizens. You know, I talked about how they served in World War II. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for coming. It's really neat to meet a Westie. Very interesting. <laughs> interesting. We love Lansbury. Yeah. Beautiful town. It sure is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. Um, just, just I don't live in Land Grove. I live in Andover. And um, when we closed, when uh, when we closed our school down, we um, our our one room schoolhouses, which I attended, um, we joined in a union with Chester, and our schoolhouses became one of them was they were sold for very little as private homes. And so I just want to say how wonderful I. I appreciate being able to be in an old schoolhouse. This is exactly what my whole family has always wished Andover had done. You know, now we can sit here, and I, I'm just so sad that my town did not either have the foresight, or the money, or <clears throat> who knows, to do this, to have a community building that, that was a school. It's lovely, isn't it? It's, and... it's, it's breathtaking. I mean, we're sitting in, the legacy of what Sam Ogden did. And Mamie, very much Mamie. It, yeah. So he, his first plan was that he was going to homeschool Jane and Sam Jr. Yeah. And Jane wanted to play with the other kids. Oh. And so they said, all right, and the school was in this ridiculous, where was the, the school was in some... The Tony Road. Yeah. yeah. Described as very, very inconvenient. Yeah. And actually, Carl Westing had the responsibility of riding around town and picking up the kids and taking them off to the school. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, you know, and then so I think Mamie chiefly was like, okay, we need a first rate rural school. We'll build one. We'll, we'll make one. You know, and they have lovely pictures of um, the school children, including Anderson's and Nielsen's, Nielsen's and, and Western children. Um, you know, and I mean, that was the wonderful thing about the scale of life for, in Vermont for Sam and Mamie is if you want to make something better, you can make it better. You can change it. They used to hold uh, dances to raise the money, right? And they would have... They have that? fun. What's that? They have dances to have fun. Oh, they dance to have fun. <laughs> 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 oh, I was told that they, they held the dances in order to raise money to uh, fix up this building in Canada. That's probably true. The dances are right in this room right there. When they did this, they didn't have power in town. So this floor was laid, and they were they hand scraped the floor mm. to be smooth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. There, there's a painting up on the wall that Bernadine Custer did of the school 
when it was in action right up here. It's this same. Oh, it's, 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 this, it's this school room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this building is relatively new. Oh no, it's it's the old Farmers and Mechanics Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. was originally. Re uh, Reposition, re repurpose, re 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 I see. Yeah, no, and I don't know how much it was being used by the farmers and mechanics, um, but they took it over <coughs> and re repurposed it for, as a school, Yeah, which would have been about 1932. Like they tried it for two years, they tried homeschooling? Something like that. I, I think it was 1932. Yeah, and, and they took great pride in it being a first, quad, first class rural school. When they closed it, which was 1965, it broke St. hard. It really did. And that's when they built the Union School at London Dairy and Weston. And Sam fought it and fought it and fought it. They, he had fought a lot of battles around 1965. He didn't like the highways, death traps. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like the legislature being reapportioned. He said, well, that's good enough for the Senate, the United States Senate, to not be by population. Chittenden County is going to take over, which it did. Um, you know, and. Uh, too much development, <coughs> much of which he had laid the groundwork for. <laughs> but at least it's state public property that we can, you know, yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful building. And I, and I remember vividly the first time I came down here and um, you showed me the map, the first time I'd ever seen Valentine's map. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which was a thrill because I'd read about it, but I'd never seen it. And then if any of you haven't seen, Valentine's map before you leave, you have to see it. Is that, that's easily accessible somewhere here. Is that true? I, I think it's in the, Don't we have it in the office? Yeah. I got a reprint of the map in uh, from the Vermont, from the UVM Special Collections, but that one will always hold a special place in my heart. And it's the, the, the original one that I saw. And is he going to get it? Yes. So what you're going to see, this map, is the thing about it that was crazy was that Alonzo Valentine was really into saying that Vermont was full of abandoned farms. And if you do a search like on newspapers.com, there's no mention of abandoned farms before 1890, 1889. But he hammered on it. And this is a map with the towns that have abandoned farms, more abandoned farms than, them than other towns, shaded in red. And yeah, and so John Nordgren, his Nebraska Swede, took this map to, um, to Sweden, to Varmland, in 1890. And the language is in Swedish up here at the top. It says map of Vermont, and then it says, good farms for sale can be had for 10 to $15 an acre, um, and uh, near railroads, and also they need lumbermen. So if you're a lumberman, there's plenty of jobs in that, too. And uh, language, language, not. Language, is not. Now, Dan, Dan, Dan is. <laughs> Weston is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Weston is. So there's Land Grove right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the one in Bennington County North? Uh, the, one, mm -hmm. the one lot on the left there. There's one? Rupert? Rupert? Something like that. <laughs> Sandy? That's like I can't see it. It looked like Sandy. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, Lottie Nyreen, who was married at the age of 14, I believe in this building, at the age of 17, three years after she'd come over and without very much English in her, um, she ended up living in Sandgate at a lumber camp on the top of a mountain. Just her being a cook, surrounded by 50 lumber. Not an easy life. Not an easy life at all. You know? She had a hard life, um, but she lived a long, healthy one too. So, yes, people should see that beautiful map. Yeah, thank you all for coming. It's great.